Okay, I'd like to just take a minute and invite our four panelists to come up to the front of the room and take a seat, and we'll um, have a little bit of a discussion about this. So Molly, that's you, Dan Kahan. <laughs> So we've got some folks up here joining us um, that I, Dan spoke yesterday, so you all have met and seen him. <laughs> and I also want to welcome Molly John from Cornell, who is a professor in genetics in the Department of Agronomy. Is that correct? Oh my gosh. What did I say? Cornell? <laughs> That's what I said. Excuse me. Excuse me, Wisconsin. <laughs> um, and Helene from the University of California at Davis, where she's the dean of the Ag and Environment School there. And Rick Borschelt from the Department of Energy, um, who is their science communication, the head of their science communications department. So thank you guys for joining us and for listening to uh, the last three presentations about what happened in the breakout sessions. I'm curious, we want to spend a little time just having some reactions to some commonalities that you've seen or um, some things that those sessions uh, made you think about as we think about the path forward. So I wonder if we could just kind of go down the line here and get some reactions and comments from each of you with whomever is ready to go first. Everyone's looking at each other. Rick, you, all, you always get to, uh, you're on the end, go first. <laughs> so is Dan, give me a break. Um, so this, yeah, he sure is. Uh, <laughs> So this, these, the breakout sessions suggested a couple of different things to me, and, and I'm going to, I think, probably address them more in a shotgun approach than in a sort of linear, um, cohesive approach, but try to tie them back to some of the themes we've heard uh, yesterday and today. And the, the first thing that I think is very clear from these three presentations is that you know, these, are, these are not a consolidated anti-GMO activist public acting in all three inst instances. That each of these instances, each of these issues brings together a different piece of the anti-GMO activity. And while it may be jumped on by other people who are, have a more broad anti-GMO activity, each of them activates different activist uh, publics. And I think to conceive of this as a broad anti-GMO activity probably does disservice both to the activist publics and to our own ability to respond. And I think I want to get back to a little bit of the depression that uh, hung around the room as a miasma yesterday, because it came up in our session, and I think in the other sessions to some extent too. You know, when we looked in and really looked hard at ourselves and said, could we have done something differently with the BT uh, corn pollen issue back in the late 90s? Would we have made a difference? Was there anything we learned yesterday or this morning that would have made a difference in that? And I think. In, in honesty to ourselves, probably not. That much of that was set in, in such a communications environment where we were, as Dietram says, not the only people communicating there. I don't think there was a lot of opportunity we had then. And I think we agree there's not a lot of opportunity we have now to change that. And that comes to the question of, so who manages the communications process? I, I absolutely agree that there's there's a need at some point for every organization, every public that engages around these issues to manage the communication, but that's the rub. Every organization that gets involved in this, no matter which side they're on or sides they're on, needs to manage their communication. We are maybe late to the game on that, but I think what keeps us late to the game is because we don't know what the game plan is. What do we manage communication to do? And we talked in our group and have talked over the course of the last two days what are the options we have to manage communications? One option we have is to keep the communication from happening in the first place. We want to kill a conversation before it starts and becomes a big brouhaha in the press or in the public. And that's always an option. I think we learned yesterday that's probably not a very good option. <laughs> There's always an option to create a very positive story for us and think we're going to carry the day with a very positive frame on a very positive science, pro-science activity. And I think we learned yesterday, and I think most of us who are realists realize we do a very good, very bad job of doing that as well, and that there are not a lot of options for us to be able to do that. 
So I think the option that we normally are looking at as an end game or as an outcome is to leaven the conversations or influence the conversations that are most important to the stakeholders we think are most critical depending on what our out our goal is. If it's regulatory uh, uh, regime, that's one thing. If it's a congressional issue, that's one thing. That's a different audience we need to speak to. But the very few of these conversations at the end of the day are national conversations that are going to affect any national political outcome of any kind and that the salience of them is very low for most people. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to some of a more general conversation around, around this, that somewhere in a, in a room just like this, probably six or eight of them, there's a group of about 60 people saying, gosh, how do we get our message about history across to people? Gosh, how do we get our, you know, our, our, our story about economics across to people? How do we get our story about the judicial system across to people? How do we get our story about you know, abortion rights across to people? And, and I have to say, science does not have a unique pull on the hearts and minds of the American people. And if we think it does, I think we should reassess that as we leave today. And, and even with Brooke's uh, masterful injection of optimism this morning, nothing's going to change that. Science is probably always going to be a low salience issue for most people most of the time. And it will arise in very specific issues around very specific things that they find meaningful. And I think to talk about these things as general conversations about science is probably not the best way for us to approach these issues. And I'll stop there for That's a great. first round. Thanks, Rick. Helene, thanks. So I think uh, for me, what, I, what kind of resonated was how did this science interface with the public audiences and who, who are the public audiences? And for at least, I was in the Monarch session, um, that was more of a reactionary thing. The, the science came out in a publication, the media hit it, and then the reactions started. And I couldn't help but wonder if we'd been talking a little bit more about um, BT corn or GMOs or whatever earlier in a more positive light, if that would have helped or not. I don't know. Uh, but it does seem that I, as a new dean only on the job for a year, a lot of the communications I've had to do are damage control. And something's coming out and somebody's mad. And, um, and I've had some where I've got two sides. One side's happy, one side's mad. So your communication, it really struck me, uh, Dietram, I think, talked about framing things. And how it's framed is huge. Um, and I think I, I might sign, sound a little um, Pollyanna, but making sure that there's a human side in it I think would help a lot. Um, I had a communication where it pointed out something that a particular group may have been doing wrong, but it almost villainized them when it didn't need to. It just needed to say that there's a consequence to this action and you know there, we are gonna work on some remediation or some mitigation. It just, it just no human co connection in that communication. So I, I really feel that framing uh, more and more as the, the two days went on is, is critical to success. Um, the other thing I, I was thinking about was that um, people mentioned community involvement and having a, a, a long history with extension. I agree with that, but I do feel that you can have community involvement but we're, we're in a nation. We're, we're how many millions of people in this country? So you're not gonna be able to have a focus group everywhere. So how do you communicate when you haven't been able to do that community involvement next door? So this can work on a sort of a local scale, but I think when you're talking about something like what happened with the monarch butterfly, that went all over the world and resonated. So how do we communicate there, I think is, is a big one. Um, the other thing that struck me, especially in the Monarch story, was that the legacy lives on. Um, Allison had a juice, I don't know if you saw on your jar of juice that she was drinking, um, it had 
the GMO symbol with the monarch butterfly on it. And so that is not going away anytime soon. And I think that, I don't think we have a strategy on this one at all. Um, so I, I just wanted to put that out there. And then I, the last thing I'll just say is, I just felt that um, another comment that was made is like positioning and framing differently. And if the, if the original frame comes out negative, how can you as university or press or somebody else respond with a frame that's positive that resonates? And so the example was that, well, this research uh, was not done well. And that was not a very good frame to set it up with. Um, and could there have been a better frame to set it up with? Um, so it just, it just really makes you think about how we speak to anyone, to the press, uh, or in our publications, et cetera, and what can we do differently? And I just felt that we were just about getting almost to that point when time was up. <laughs> um, before I turn it over to you, Molly, I also want to remind folks that there are people on the web broadcast. And if folks watching online um, want to send any tweets to us with questions or comments to interject at the end of this day, we'd love to hear that. The hashtag is NAS Interface. And I'll uh, pull the thread up and just kind of monitor it while we're having this discussion, too. Thanks. Molly. OK, so um, as pausing for just a moment's reflection um, on where my remarks are going to come from and following Brooke's instruction to qualify myself up here. Uh, I'm reminded that in 1991 as a vegetable breeder, because I didn't know any better and I was the youngest one there, I was sent to upstate New York, way upstate, because people were leafleting supermarkets about BST milk. And I was going to go explain <laughs> how it was that this milk did not cause breast cancer. Speaking of playing catch up, that was a long time ago. That was 1991 or 1992. And so one of my, um, one of my personal reactions to this forum is that I have been doing this my whole career, which includes a lot of time spent as a professor. Also, I've concluded my deanship. And we're still having this conversation. And so I want to take a step back with my remarks and reflect on that. Because I think that the genetic engineering debate represents an extreme on a spectrum of um, technologies that represent innovations in agriculture. And I think we are an extreme in a direction that has been extremely costly almost any way you look at this public dialogue. Doesn't matter where you sit, I think, in relation to your assessment of these technologies, the condition of this conversation has been extremely costly. In, and I would say that those, the costs, we can't quantify well. And that bothers me as a scientist. That bothers me as an administrator. And I think it is um, one of the ways in which this conversation is allowed to persist in this condition. So what do I mean? Well, genetic engineering technologies represent a zone of innovation in agriculture highly relevant to agriculture, of course, not to mention medicine and pretty much any other aspect of the human condition. I'm a plant breeder by training. And the fact that one subset of the technologies that I used in my plant breeding program became the focus of this debate, whereas many other technologies I use, also for innovation in agriculture, were overlooked, and in some cases deliberately overlooked by the same regulatory community that was attracted to this conversation. I think those ironies are not lost on any of us with a technical background. Um, and the inconsistencies and idiosyncrasies of the way this particular set of innovation has been treated is also not lost on us. That said, what are the characteristics of our space in, with respect to discourse about these, these innovations? One important thing to realize, speaking of values, and I was very glad to hear we did speak of values, because I think we missed a lot of that in these early discussions, is that actually innovation is valued very differently by different communities. People have very different expectations for innovation. And, um, and while the science and technology community tends to think of innovation equals great, 
right? That's not the way everybody feels. And I think the science community has had a huge blind spot, and probably science communication as well, um, on this particular issue. And so genetic engineering is a category of innovation, and I think we have a lot to learn about communicating about innovations. I also think, though, in the most rigorous scientific sense possible, we have a lot to learn about describing unintended consequences, particularly unintended and eminently foreseeable consequences. I think um, actually our agriculture, our ecosystems are littered with examples of innovations with unintended consequences, some of them also very costly. And so another observation of our community, another blind spot has been to underestimate those dynamics in public debate and to dismiss and discredit those who have legitimate concerns about unintended, both foreseeable and unforeseeable outcomes related to innovation and to um, dismiss and, um, and fail to respect um, concerns about those consequences. I would say, uh, actually I saw a big headline today about science communication on planetary boundaries. I think we in the science world would consider, this was Washington Post this morning, a big success, big science paper having a huge impact on framing the global dialogue about planetary safe space. Agriculture, of course, plays an important role, and some would place genetic engineering technologies very squarely in that debate in many different ways. Um, and I think in that case, um, it's positive press. Um, it is about framing. It is absolutely about framing, and one of the key messages of that paper, and I was pleased to see it reported in a post today, I haven't seen the rest of the press, is that our lack of rigor in estimating our progress against these planetary boundaries is a dangerous limitation. It's a dangerous technical and scientific limitation. And this paper, I'm sure, will spur vast investment in each of those spaces of the conversation. We were unable to do that in this debate. Um, and I think as a consequence, we have gotten caught in yelling at each other over years. As a matter of fact, we've institutionalized the yelling at each other to the point where I think those of us in genetic engineering feel this is the only way it could possibly be. And so what I'd like to do is, is finish my remarks by saying that there are a vast array, and I speak um, both from my general experience as a citizen and as a scientist, but also as one who did some USDA service, there are a vast array of reg regulated technologies relevant to food systems. The vast majority of those no one ever hears about. And the regulatory processes are considered, even by those of us that understand how important they are, um, as, you know, the, the, best is, the best is no news is good news, but, you know, they're, to be honest, rather dull processes for anybody who likes, you know, the frontier. And yet they're critically important institutions for negotiating the public discourse about the fate of that technology and its implementation in, in food systems. And so I'd like to close with a message which I refined while I was a dean that I find has worked magnificently related to general innovation in food systems, and in particular this, um, this topic. And it's quite a different frame, and it really was because I was sick and tired by 2006 of going head to head into a conversation where I felt we did not have good quality discourse, and there's blame to be had all around, or perhaps it's fairer to say new insights from which we may or may not have done things differently. And, um, and so here's a message I have tested many times in many frames. It works great. Everybody knows that food is really important, and that's well beyond the fact that it, it's our source of survival, our source of nutrition every day. Um, nobody wants to wreck the planet growing food, and diversity is the sign of a healthy system. If you're a dean, you learn to say that over and over mm -hmm. and over again because nobody argues with any of those points. And I believe that our, our um, consideration of this technology belongs in each of those points as a matter of fact. And I think any of you could frame your relationship to genetic engineering technologies in relation to each of those points. And, um, and I'm going to leave by saying that 
in, in my view, I have seen many, many cases where public institutions very effectively broker the dialogue about innovation to the point where you all wouldn't even know about it or wouldn't care, even though you are specialists in, in food-related technologies. And that's the sign of a good, of a system that works. I would say our regulatory um, apparatus, no matter how you feel about it in this space, has, has, um, has demonstrably failed to broker a, a high quality public discourse. And, um, and that is a very costly condition. It is not business as usual, and it is very costly. Again, I've said I don't think we can depict that cost, but I'm delighted to see this dialogue about that cost and about alternative ways that we may progress because these technologies are obviously here to stay. They're, um, you know, in fact, many of the conversations, the technical conversations, are virtually obsolete um, because of the ways in which genetic technologies have moved since 1991 or whatever year it was that you first got involved in these fights. And, um, and one other thing I learned being dean is that um, where there is respect, and it is, I'm really happy to hear the messages about granularity in any of these discussions, where there is respectful discourse, it's my experience that we more often get better quality outcomes in the public interest. That does not mean there aren't vested financial interests. There are absolutely everywhere. And um, confounding those interests is one of the things our regulatory system does not necessarily, or deconfounding those interests is one of the things our regulatory system does not necessarily do a great job of. So Molly, one of the things that you brought up, I think, was a theme that we might want to talk about as a group in a few minutes, which is the science communication environment relationship with the regulatory environment. Absolutely. So that might be something we want to discuss with the group as we continue on with this panel. Great. Thanks, Molly. Dan. Well, I disagree about the respect point. I think that will get much further. If not, no, I, I, I do agree with that. Um, <laughs> actually, one of the... Can I make one last point, which is there are formal... Sorry, this, I wanted to say this explicitly. The role of Native American populations in, um, in a discourse related to these technologies came up in our breakout group. There are formalities with respect to the way regulatory processes engage many communities, including tribal communities. Well, I don't know. I, I will be surprised that a formal, um, form the formality of consultation processes are implemented, and that's just one example of ways in which our current structures could be improved with respect to fostering that respectful discipline. Great. Thank you. Well, I disagree entirely. Actually, one of the, I think, I agree with that too. Um, one of the, um, uh, the uh, moderators from the, uh, one of the breakout sessions described uh, their discussion is spirited, I guess, which means that they probably were arguing a lot. Um, and, and I think that um, maybe our, our session was spirited, but uh, we, we ended up uh, uh, unifying um, uh, around uh, the, the shared interest we had in uh, defeating uh, our common enemy, uh, which is entropy. Um, that, that it, was, it was, in a sense, almost like our meeting was a, a, a model um, of what uh, maybe the, the science communication problem um, is in our society. Uh, we were there to try to put our heads together to talk about, oh, what should we do to uh, be sure that the information and the science on uh, genetically modified mosquitoes is properly uh, uh, received by the public. And, and I had the reaction, and Dominique, and maybe some others too, this is the reinventing the wheel point. You're ignoring all of the information that's out there. I mean, that's entropy. We, ha we know something. It would be nice if we knew more, but, but don't just assume you know what the answer is, and, and don't assume that there isn't any information out there. Start with what we know. But it turned out that really um, we knew more than we thought, even about what we were talking about. Um, Oxitec, it was reported that we told them, oh, you should be doing better surveys. We didn't know what they were doing. Um, and it wasn't even made part of the, the presentation at the outset. Um, and, and we ended up hearing over the course of the discussion about the things that they were doing. And I found it, it fascinating. Um, and obviously they had learned some things um, the hard way. <laughs> um, but the kinds of, of outreach that they were doing in Florida, I thought it was, it was really fascinating. But most of all, I thought, boy, that, that information you're generating um, in having this uh, experience of trying to uh, engage a community um, about a consequential form of science, 
is extremely valuable. <laughs> are you recording it? Are you doing something to preserve it um, so that the next time somebody has to do this, they're going to have the benefit of, of this information? Maybe because if somebody had done that the, the last time, you wouldn't have had to learn the hard way <laughs> because you could have started with what they already knew. Um, it, we almost missed finding out what Oxitec had been up to. And we didn't learn as much about it even as I thought it would have been nice to. But what we learned is that it's just far too easy not to, to make use um, of the information. Um, the information that we have um, from study and that, that is out there, but the information that is a byproduct of just having to do what it is we're talking about doing, um, which is trying to, to steer uh, a, a, an issue that is informed by science along a path that will assure uh, that the best evidence we have gets to the people who need to use it to make decisions in their lives. Um, and you do need evidence um, for that. Uh, and I guess that, that this is, this is uh, I mean, it was talked about how you know, we have problems institutionally, who's responsible for these things, we need a repository and so forth. But, but one of the, the things I've been heartened about at the, this meeting is that I think uh, it, that, that there really has been um, a, a, a common recognition um, of the need uh, to, to use evidence um, in trying to understand how it is um, that people come to know what they know um, in order to make sure uh, that society gets the benefit of whatever the knowledge is we have about both the benefits um, and the risks um, of genetic, genetically modified organisms. Um, I mean, our common enemy is that we might not get the benefit of the common knowledge. It doesn't matter what our positions are, because whatever we, our values are, we won't be able to reliably achieve what we want to achieve if we don't really understand all the, infra, all the best evidence um, that we have. Um, frankly, you know, I was a little anxious. <laughs> I think somebody referred to like phone calls in advance of the meeting, they were spirited. Um, and, and I think I was a little bit anxious myself that maybe the meeting would just sort of take it for granted um, that there's a, 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 a problem in public perceptions of, 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 the, of uh, genetically modified organisms. Because I don't think there is any uh, perception. Maybe that is a problem. Um, I mean, and, and I think Rick made a good point that you, you, don't, you don't try to slip something in without a discussion when there really ought to be one. But I'm concerned that we not have a discussion, the premise of which is false, which is that there's a high degree of public concern about genetically modified organisms because people just don't know about this issue. Maybe they should, but, but if, it, if you start with the premise that there, there, there's conflict about it, you're wrong. And, and a lot of people in this room are involved in conflict. But that's because you live inside an environment where everybody actually is a stakeholder in genetically modified organism technologies. And you live in universities where people fight each other about it and so forth and so on. But, but that's not, right? If you, if you have an evidence-based orientation, you're, you're worried that you might generalize from your biased sample of your own, your own life to, to things that, you're, that you really want to engage that are outside of you. Um, I think we should, if, if I, the, 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 if I were going to frame how we should think about uh, the discussions we've had, um, we, should, we shouldn't be focused so much on information processing. Right? And, and I'm saying this, I, I, I'm, I'm talking against interest in a way because I study these kinds of decision-making biases that consumers right, people might make in, in their consumer decisions. I don't think anybody's making m mistakes in their consumer decisions about genetically modified organisms or at least they're not, they're not uh, reacting to information in a biased way because they're not even reacting to it, right? So to talk about uh, the way in which people are going to be, be misprocessing information, it's not what we're talking about here. It, it, when it's said that this issue is framed, it's not. People don't know what genetically modified organisms are. There are groups out there that are trying to message things, right? But when you're talking about framing and the negative frames and people be, the kind of concerns about political polarization, they don't, they just don't exist. Now that doesn't, and if you start with that premise, that doesn't mean, oh, what it, there's no point having a meeting like this. There is a huge point in having a meeting like this. It's because you don't take for granted 
the process by which people who need to make decisions in their private lives or as citizens come to know what's known by science. You use the best evidence you have to make sure that that process works. But the problem here isn't about information processing. I mean, I agree with Rick that what we're talking about here is a, a science communication environment issue. And no matter, there are lots of things we, we do know about genetically modified organisms, lots of things we don't and need to know, but, but one thing for sure is we understand that this is a very consequential kind of science. Um, and, and it's important for people to be oriented with respect to the best information we have on this science. And it's great to know that it isn't the case yet that we have the kind of environment for decision making that makes it really hard for people to recognize the best evidence on, as we have, for example, on something like, like fracking or climate change. Right? But the way that we should do this is to try to think, how can we, when, when companies like Oxitec or Monsanto, other, other actors are generating this kind of technology and it's being, being brought to bear on important issues for our society, create the conditions in which we can be confident that people will make the decisions based on the diverse values that they have and the kinds of interests that they're going to have to negotiate through democratic processes, will recognize the best information that happens to be available. Right? And think about that in an evidence-based way. Right? Prevent the, the, the public opinion from being the way that I think it's a mistake to think that it already is. There's a big point right, in having this, this meeting. We, we want to think about this science communication environment and we want to do it in an evidence-based way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have a, a question to follow up on that for the panel and for folks in this room too. Um, I've heard a number, the, the, all three of you said something about the reactionary nature to your job sometimes and things come fast and needing to be reactionary in your communications. And that I imagine that many conversations I've had with many of you who work on these issues, as Dan said, you're involved in a small sliver of people who are really passionate, interested, and focused on these issues. And so to keep the perspective of what is really going on with the public and their perceptions is really important. But how do, how do, all, how do all of us reconcile that tension between our microcosm community of that really contentious stuff that happens every day in our life with the big picture, the public still has not made up their mind about this and they're wanting to get productive information and have the, the unpolluted scientific communication environment. So what's, how can we think about that in the real world? Because that's great to hear, but I think a lot of people go back and feel like in their, their microcosm that it's, it's hard sometimes and it is reactionary and it is contentious. Response? 